Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. We begin with Allah's blessed name. We praise Him and we glorify Him as He ought to be praised and glorified. And we pray for peace and for blessings on all His noble messengers and in particular on the last of them all, the blessed Prophet Muhammad sallallahu ta'ala alayhi wa sallam. As I greet you with assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh, a great a greeting of peace and may evil be kept away from you, that is salam. I'm greeting you here from my sitting room in my home in the Caribbean island of Trinidad with my books, all these books I have to read, I've not read them as yet, uh, while I'm writing my book on, on Dajjal here in my Caribbean island of Trinidad. I greet you with salam wherever you are in the world. And uh, we have our own recording equipment now, alhamdulillah. So I'm not <laughs> dependent on the IBN studio anymore. Uh, that's a whole one hour's drive away from here in San Fernando up to the north of the island in, um, uh, for the IBN studio. So we, we have completed the month of Ramadan, the blessed month of Ramadan, and we pray that Allah may accept our fast of Ramadan, may accept our fast of Shawwal, uh, may accept our Salat of Taraweeh in the month of Ramadan. I was so fortunate uh, this Ramadan to go to a masjid in the south of Trinidad, in South Oropuj, Masjid al Furqan, uh, where the Imam was not reciting the whole Quran in Ramadan. Oh, no, not at all. He recited passages and he recited beautifully and slowly, and it was a joy. It brought tears to my eyes to listen to the Quran in this Ramadan. Not that stupidness, that foolishness in trying to recite the whole Quran in Ramadan at 195 miles an hour, showing manifest disrespect for the Quran and committing sin while reciting the Quran. May Allah protect us from such foolishness. And uh, may Allah accept our um, Sadaqat in Ramadan and our Tilawat al-Quran in Ramadan. And now it is the month of Shawwal and uh, 10 days of Shawwal have ended. Tonight is the 11th night and I have recited so far maybe up to Surah to Ibrahim of the Quran. I hope that you are reciting the whole Quran as well every month now. Don't forget the Quran or the Ramadan has ended. Every month you should try to recite the whole Quran cover to cover. This is the minimum, minimum duty we have to the Quran, to recite it in Arabic from cover to cover. Why is it so important? When you recite the Quran, you'll get nur. Allah will give you nur. If you recite and Allah accepts your recitation of the Quran, you'll get nur. And uh, when you have nur, then you can see what otherwise cannot be seen. And there are so many people in the world today the world is filled with people who have eyes and yet cannot see. Most of them, of course, in government. Most of them in government. They have eyes and yet cannot see. And Dajjal is ruling the world and Dajjal is beating his drum. And they all have to dance to every tune that Dajjal plays. Oh my gosh. So when you recite the Quran and Allah accepts your recitation and he puts noor in your heart, and provided that you are doing your homework, you'll get light with which to see and you'll be able to understand the reality of the world in which you live today. And uh, today, tonight, I want to spend a little time uh, devoting attention to one aspect of that reality that confronts us in the world today. So many of you have been writing to me asking me sometimes, demanding of me, please, please, please tell us what's happening with Saudi Arabia and Qatar. Hmm? And uh, yes, there are dramatic events taking place. And unless one can connect the dots, one will not know what's happening. Uh, I would like to uh, begin my talk tonight by suggesting that's all I can do, suggesting I'm not a prophet. No, I don't have some crystal ball in which I can see the future. No, Allah has not sent the future to me, informing me. No, I'm just using 
the intellect that Allah has given to me using internal intuitive spiritual insight of a little bit of which I've been blessed trying to connect the dots and to seek to understand what is happening in the world today and in the process I can make mistakes oh yes I can make mistakes and I have made mistakes in the past and I'm happy when I make mistakes because when you make a mistake and you realize that you've made a mistake the first thing you must do of course is to correct yourself and set an example for those who come after you that they also would recognize we all make mistakes but that should not mean that we should give up no when you make a mistake and you realize it's a mistake you correct yourself like i had said was it 2009 i came to the conclusion that russia was magog and that the west uh, the western world was gog and that was wrong that was wrong that was a mistake and I have apologized to you for even making mention of that mistake now because it was a mistake. The correct position is that Gog and Magog are those who brought the Jews back to the Holy Land. The Soviet Union certainly was part of it, but not Russia. And if you don't know the difference between the Soviet Union and Russia, you're still a schoolboy. You're still a schoolboy, yes. So I did make mistakes in the past and I corrected myself now. And uh, what's happening now with Saudi Arabia, I believe, and uh, I am subject to correction, that the, uh, the Saudi leadership, those who today control power in Saudi Arabia, the young prince who is the son of the king, the young reckless schoolboy, uh, he probably understands and uh, there are others around him he'd been able to convince that yes the big war is coming and that it is the melhama and that in that big war israel is going to lash out and israel is going to seek to expand its territory to encompass the biblical frontiers of the holy land and of course the biblical frontiers of the Holy Land are in conflict with the frontiers of the Holy Land in the Quran. Which one is correct? Time will tell. And uh, they realize that when once that war takes place, the anger in the world of Islam against Israel and against Saudi Arabia, which has been a friend and ally of Israel, increasingly perceived as a friend and ally of Israel, the anger in the world of Islam against the Saudi regime will be so great that they will not be able to survive. No. The writing is on the wall for two states, for Saudi Arabia and for Singapore. That one is little Israel and this one is a little bigger Israel. So Singapore and Saudi Arabia. <coughs> so both of these states are in a serious predicament. What to do? Do you sit down and wait with folded arms until the big war begins and then it'll be too late to do anything? Or do you take uh, preemptive action uh, before the war starts? The war can start at any time. The big war can start at any time. My understanding, and I am subject to correction, is that what the new Saudi leadership is doing, and it is of course reckless on their part to do it, is to try to maneuver themselves in such a situation as to take out what they may, may be called an insurance policy that they would survive the great war that insurance policy means that they must project themselves as the leader of the sunni world of islam undisputed leadership of the sunni world of islam uh, in succession to the ottoman empire and this leadership of the Sunni world of Islam is meant to take the Sunni world of Islam into civil war against the Shia world of Islam. And uh, in the process of Sunni-Shia civil war, Saudi Arabia as a leader of the Sunni world will survive because there will be solidarity in the ranks of the Sunni Muslims saying we are fighting for Sunni Islam against Shia Islam. And so Saudi Arabia will survive. Uh, with the recognition as leader of the Sunni world of Islam. Um, in order to achieve this status as le of leadership of the Sunni world of Islam, they need to provoke 
some kind of a war. And they need to bring the world of Sunni Islam together with them in that war. And so what they have done is to amass this coalition of uh, Sunni states whose leaders have all come together to sign an agreement. I believe they have signed an agreement to establish what they call an anti-terrorist bloc to fight terrorism. And it's obviously an anti-Shia bloc because it's, Iran has not been invited. Iraq has been invited and Iraq is led by Shias, but then Iraq is also part of the, the, the Yankee world because they have close ties with the United States of America. Um, so, you, so we have this alliance now of Sunni states and uh, the former chief of staff of the Pakistan Armed Forces uh, is, the, is appointed as the commander-in-chief of this entire bloc of Sunni states. And once they had the pieces in place uh, and the agreement signed and everything in place, then they pulled it ace out of the cards. That is, they invited uh, the American president, Donald Trump, to come to Saudi Arabia and then brought all the leaders of the Sunni world of Islam by hook or by crook, some of them by their neck, brought them all to Riyadh to, to, to meet with, with Trump so that you will cement an alliance between NATO and Sunni Islam. Why do they want this alliance between NATO and Sunni Islam? What is the big plan at work? And how does Qatar fit into this? Um, I am of the opinion that Qatar, because it has been, like Saudi Arabia, a major actor um, supporting state-sponsored terrorism, arming uh, the, the Yankee jihadists, I call them, arming them, providing them with weapons, providing them with funds, providing them with training, providing them with logistical support, uh, to wage their bogus jihad in Syria, to wage their bogus jihad in Iraq, to wage, wage their bogus jihad in Libya. Qatar and Saudi Arabia have been the two major actors in this state-sponsored terrorism. But the difference between Qatar and Saudi Arabia is that Qatar is exposed geographically. It's a little, it's a peninsula jutting out into the sea and facing Iran. And once war starts with Iran, Qatar is finished. Saudi Arabia has a big land mass, and Saudi Arabia therefore will be able to put up some resistance, but Qatar no. So Qatar realized that they can't be part and parcel of this grand alliance that is going to, with, with NATO, that is going to uh, take some kind of a military action that eventually would provoke Sunni Shia civil war. And so Qatar is not prepared to toe the line. And Qatar wants to hedge her bets by maintaining friendly, friendly ties with Iran, while yet promoting terrorism. And uh, the Saudis are not prepared to allow any Sunni state to step out of line, because if one were to show the courage to step out of line and resist, then that will help others, that will give support to others, that will give encouragement to others who sim similarly have, have misgivings and so on. They're not too happy with it. They also will take some support from Qatar standing up and they also will be reluctant to join. And the Saudis cannot allow that. They want a solid Sunni bloc standing behind them and then put this solid Sunni bloc in alliance with NATO. That's why you have Trump there. And this is the reason why you have this conflict now between Saudi Arabia and Qatar and Saudi client states around Saudi Arabia, supporting Saudi Arabia. Well, then what is the grand plan? What is the master plan? What do the Saudis want to do? And for this, they need to have the solidarity of the Sunni world. I have already said that uh, the master plan, of course, is to to, to ferment, to provoke Sunni Shia 
civil war. And this will solidify Saudi Arabia's position of leadership over the Sunni world. And it'll be like an insurance policy ensuring that the Saudis will survive the great war which is coming. But I want to now suggest that there's something else at work. And this is the most important thing that I want to share with you in this brief talk. And that is that I fear, I hope I'm wrong, I hope I'm wrong, I wish I'm wrong, but I see the, I see the moves on the chessboard and I read it and understand it in this way, that there's going to be a sudden, a lightning a move to land troops in Syria, northern Syria, land troops from every single NATO member state and every single Sunni Muslim state led by Saudi Arabia. And this is what our Prophet was mentioning, speaking about when he mentioned that they come under 80 flags and each flag would have 12,000 troops under the flag. I hope I'm wrong, I wish I'm wrong, but this is what I fear, that this prophecy of Prophet Muhammad might be fulfilled in the coming days or weeks with, the, with every single NATO member state sending troops and every single Sunni Muslim state sending troops. Uh, and this is why Qatar has to be forced into line. I don't know whether they'll attack Qatar militarily. I don't know whether they'll do it or not. Somebody else might be able to tell you that. But when they land their troops, they will present Russia with what they hope to be a fait accompli. That the battle lines will be drawn. You have a vast array of NATO troops and a vast array of the whole Sunni world of Islam, all militarily present in northern Syria, facing the Syrian army, supported by Russia. And uh, this is precisely the scenario which is there in the Hadith, which leads to uh, the Malhama, or to what the Christian, in, in Christian eschatology is called Armageddon. I am surprised that this great war has not started as yet. I had several dreams indicating to me that nuclear war is coming. I felt when uh, Donald Trump won the election uh, and instead of Hillary Clinton, that this was for us uh, a window of sunshine, that the Great War is now perhaps postponed for a few months. Well, it's more than six months now since the elections of last November. And uh, I don't believe the Great War has started as yet, although some of my critics might differ with me. <laughs> yes, they differ with me in everything that I say. So, uh, the Great War has not started as yet. And for that, we have to thank Allah. The window of sunshine, meaning, by the window of sunshine, meaning a postponement of the Great War. That is what I mean by a window of sunshine, that the Great War has been postponed for a while. For how much longer would it be postponed? I don't know. But what I know for certain is that it's coming. It's just a matter of time. And I'm not the only analyst who have come to this conclusion. There are so many others who have come to the same conclusion. And I think the Russian leadership themselves have come to the conclusion that nuclear war is inevitable. It's just a matter of time. Uh, if I am correct, that Saudi Arabia is going to lead the Sunni world of Islam into an alliance with NATO, and this in turn will cause, will, will, will play out with every single Muslim country, Sunni country, sending troops, and every single NATO country sending troops, and all of these troops landing in the north of Syria in a vast array, 80 flags, <laughs> facing the Syrian army in order to force regime change in Syria uh, so that Syria will become 
another Libya. If this is correct, if this analysis on my part is correct, then how do we respond? How do we respond? The answer is, it is almost certain that there are fabrications in some of the hadiths uh, concerning Akhir Zaman. And uh, we should therefore be very, very careful when studying the hadith pertaining to Akhir Zaman and in particular to the Malhama. Uh, we must use proper methodology. And uh, proper methodology, here is my book, Methodology. Yes. Methodology for study of the Quran. You must study this book. Um, we have it in French now. We have it in Arabic. Uh, we have it in uh, several languages. It's being translated to Russian. We have it in the Serbian language now. It's going to be available for you in Bosnia, in Serbia, and so on. This book explains to you proper methodology. And proper methodology when studying the ahadis pertaining to the malhama is that you must go first to the Quran and you must study the subject from the Quran. And then having studied the subject from the Quran and having brought all the verses of the Qur'an on the subject into a harmonious whole and located what my teacher Mawlana Fadl Rahman Ansari Rahimahullah calls the system of meaning of the subject. Then and only then do you turn to the hadith. And when you find a hadith is in harmony with the Qur'an, you accept it. And if you find a hadith is in conflict with the Qur'an, you turn away from it. But in addition to this, I want to suggest to you that you will find a hadith in which part of the hadith is in harmony with the Qur'an and part is in conflict with the Qur'an. So you have to be extremely vigilant as a researcher, as a student, as a scholar, extremely vigilant to be able to locate whenever and wherever a hadith or a part of a hadith is in conflict with the Quran, so that you will put it aside and not allow it to corrupt your understanding of the subject. With that, having said that, we now turn to the hadith concerning alliance with room because the hadith says that room will land in the north of Syria, room under 80 flags. And uh, room, of course, we mention in this book, at the end of this book, you'll find the last, I think the last part of the last chapter that Rome, at the time of the revelation of the Qur'an, Rome was a Christian world. And that Christian world had its headquarters in Constantinople at the time of the revelation of the Qur'an. And that Christian world was known as the Byzantine Empire. But that Christian world then broke into two after the revelation of the Qur'an. And there came into being a room of the East, which is the old Byzantine Empire, which today is known as Orthodox Christianity. That is Rome. But there's also another Rome, which is the Western Christianity, which is headed by the Roman Catholic Church. And they are located in Rome. And so they say Roman, <laughs> uh, in Rome, the Vatican. 
And then that Roman Catholic Church itself broke up and you have the Protestant movement and you have this and that and the other, the Anglican, the Church of England, and so on. It is this Western Christianity which I call Rome of the West. And they have the celebration of Christmas according to the Gregorian calendar of Pope Gregory. They broke away from the previous calendar, which was known as the Julian calendar, which is still used by the Orthodox Christian world. And in that Orthodox Christian world, they, they celebrate their Christmas in January, whereas these celebrate their Christmas in December, December 25th. In that Orthodox Christian world, the cathedral is just like a masjid. There are no chairs, no chairs to sit down. In this Christian world, of course, you have pews and you have chairs and the, the ones at the front used to be reserved for the white and the ones at the back for the blacks. Hmm? That was yesterday. And today it's uh, a little bit more sophisticated, but the racism is still there. So, room of the West and room of the East. And this requires you to be careful when the Hadith uses the word room. When you go to the Quran, however, the Quran speaks of room in a very positive way. There is a whole surah of the Quran entitled Surah to Room. So when the Quran speaks positively of room, and it says, room, regime. room has been defeated, but room is going to be successful in just a few years' time. And on that day, on that day when room is successful, the you Muslims are going to celebrate. So there is a natural affinity a natural friendship between you and Rome because you will be celebrating their victory. I know there are some people who don't like the Quran. They wish this was not in the Quran. Let them go their way and let us remain faithful with the Quran. So there is, according to the Quran, a natural affinity between Muslims and Rome because we celebrate room. We're not talking about history, we're talking about the Quran. Why do you run from the Quran? What's wrong with you? Go and be faithful to the Quran. Let history conform with the Quran. Go to the Quran as your primary source of guidance. Is that scholarship? That you should go to history and forget the Quran? That's schoolboys. There is a natural affinity and friendship between Muslims and Rome based on the Quran. It gets me angry when my critics cannot see and cannot understand the Quran. No matter what I do, I can't get them to understand. There is a natural friendship and affinity between Muslims and Rome based on the Quran. Because Allah says, وَيَوْمَ إِذِنْ يَفْرَحُ الْمُؤْمِنُونَ On that day when Rome is victorious, you Muslims will celebrate. بِنَصْرِ اللَّهِ يَنْصُرُ مَنْ يَشَاءُ You celebrate Allah's help, the victory that Allah has given to Rome on that day. Min kablu wa min ba'd, the Quran speaks min kablu wa min ba'd, that there is victory at this time and there is victory to come. So Rome is going to have a yet another victory, and on that next victory you will again celebrate. Which victory it is and which Rome is Allah speaking about? Rome are Christians. So which Christian people, which Christian people is Allah speaking about? Can you imagine my frustration? with these dumb dumbs who cannot understand? Which Christian people is Allah speaking about when he speaks about Rome? He says in Surah 
Maeda, uh, he says, "Wala tajidan akrabahum mawaddatan lilladina amanu ladina qalu inna nasara." And I have dealt with this verse in this book. Would you kindly read what I have written in this book about the subject? Would you please read it before you start criticizing me? Huh? He says in the Quran that in time to come, as at the time of the revelation of the Quran, that there will be a Christian people who will be closest in love and affection for you Muslims. Are you listening? That you will most certainly find at this time when the Quran is revealed and in time to come because the grammar is fail modaria. At the time when the Quran was revealed it took place that Orthodox Christianity or the Christian world in, in, in Abyssinia embraced us and protected us and showed friendship for us. And in time to come, the Christian world will again be the same like that, closest in love and affection for you Muslims. There are Muslims who have their brains, I don't know where, in Hollywood, and they don't like this verse of the Quran. They cannot accept it. But let them go their way and leave us alone. We don't need you. Go your way. They will have the greatest love and affection for us Muslims in time to come. Who are these Christians? Is it room of the East or room of the West? The, the Quran in Surah Al-Anfal deals with the subject of alliances. Surah Al-Anfal is the eighth surah of the Quran. The eighth surah of the Quran, Surah Al-Anfal. And in that surah Allah says, remember this is the surah of military alliances, international relations and so on, Surah Al-Anfal. I'm sorry I'm perspiring, it's very hot here and we cannot even turn on the fans because of the noise that comes from the fans here. He says that um, the kuffar are friends and allies of each other. That's what Allah says in the Quran. And our Prophet said, Sallallahu Ta'ala Alaihi Wasallam, he said, Al Kufru Middatun Wahida. But they all comprise one block, one community, the kuffar. No matter where they are from, they constitute one community. And Allah says, Illam tafa'alu, if you do not also build alliances to form one block, takun fitnatun fil ardi wa fasadun kabir. So if there is to be an alliance in akhiru zaman, it is because of the Quran, not the Hadith. It is the Quran, the Quran, the Quran which is asking you to form alliances. And if you do not do it, says Allah, there will be great facade in the world, great corruption in the world, fitnatun fil ad, and great trials in the world, if you do not do it. So you have, if you want to be faithful to the Quran, you got to go out there and build alliances. With whom will you build an alliance, you dum-dum? Answer, you will build an alliance with those who are closest in love and affection to you. That's what you do. And who are those who will be closest in love and affection to you? The book of answer, the book of Allah replies. The book of Allah does not tell lies. Washington tells lies, but the book of Allah does not lie. Saudi Arabia tells lies. The Pakistani government tells monstrous lies. But the book of Allah does not lie. And the book of Allah says that in time to come you'll find a Christian people who will be closest in love and affection for you. You don't believe me? Go and look in the Quran. If you don't like the Quran, that's not my problem. If you cannot accept the Quran, that's not my problem. 
My duty is to teach what is in the Quran, whether you like it or whether you don't. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah that so many in the world today are understanding and accepting what we preach and what we teach concerning the Quran. Just you are the ones, the only ones who cannot accept it. Because you are fixated, you are one-eyed, you are one-track mind, you have wrong methodology, and you reject everything, everything, everything that we say. So go your way and let us go ours. Go your way and let us go our way and Allah will judge between us. Yes. So we say that we have to choose now between the two, two rooms. Which one is it? Who will be the ones with whom we should form an alliance in Akhiru Zaman? Because Allah says in the Quran, if you don't do it, there will be fitna in the world and great facade if you don't do it. So the obligation for establishing an alliance with room comes from the Quran, not from the Hadith, from the Quran. Good. We say it cannot be room of the West. Why? Because Allah has prohibited us, prohibited us from maintaining friendly ties and forming alliance with that part of the Christian world which itself is in friendship and alliance with the Jewish world because that is also in Surah Al-Ma'idah. Ya ayyuhu alladhina amanu la tattakhizu al-yahuda wa nasara awliya Don't take such Jews and don't take such Christians as your friends and allies ba'aduhum awliya wa ba'aduhu themselves are friends and allies of each other. If I am wrong in my explanation of this verse, you tell me what is the meaning of the verse. Come on, tell me if I'm wrong. The question of the West, Rome of the West, has established an alliance with the Jews. It's a Judeo-Christian alliance. And it is that alliance which has brought the Jews back to the Holy Land, Banu Israel back to the Holy Land. And Allah says in Surah Al-Anbiya that that is Gog and Magog. وَحَرَامٌ عَلَىٰ قَرْيَةٍ أَهْلَقْنَاهَا أَنَّهُمْ لَا يَرْجِعُونَ حَتَّى إِذَا فُتِحَتْ يَأْجُوجُ وَمَأْجُوجُ وَهُمْ مِنْ كُلِّ حَلَبٍ يَنْسِلُونَ When Gog and Magog are released and they spread out in all directions with their indestructible power, you will see these people being brought back to their town from which they have been expelled and then banned from returning to the town. Which town? Jerusalem. So Rome of the West is Gog and Magog. Rome of the West is the biggest oppressor in the world today. Rome of the West is waging war, not just on Islam, but waging war on Orthodox Christianity and waging war on the religious way of life. Rome of the West is waging war not only on Islam, but waging war on Orthodox Christianity and waging war on the religious way of life, which includes Hinduism, includes Buddhism. That's what Rome of the West is doing. So we, can we be in alliance with them when Allah has prohibited it? So then which Christians would it be that Allah speaks about positively in the Quran and with whom we have a natural affinity? That when they are victorious, we celebrate. Answer, it has to be room of the East. It has to be room of the East. Do we have to make them friendly to us? Oh, no. No, 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 it's not dependent on how we behave with them. It is not dependent on how we behave with them. No. It is what Allah has declared will happen, whether you like it or whether you don't like it. That Christian world is going to become closest in friendship and alliance with us. Friendship, friendship and love and affection for us. That Christian world is going to be closest in love and affection for us Muslims. Whether you like it or whether you don't, whether you approve of it or whether you don't, it is not dependent upon you. It's happening already. The Orthodox Christian world is already drawing closer to the Muslim world, despite 600 years of bloody Ottoman oppression, 
despite Hagia Sophia being taken away from them and convertingly converted sinfully, monstrously, shamefully into a masjid. And the Muslims of Turkey cannot understand that. When are you going to wake up? Hmm? Despite the enslavement of Christian women, that they belong to the harem, despite taking Christian boys and converting them by force to Islam, and then training them to become the Janissaries, the elite fighting force of the Ottoman Empire, Christian boys converted to Islam by force. Shame on you! Despite all these things that the Ottoman Empire did, endless wars against Russia, enslavement by the Crimean Tatars of Russian people, despite all of that, the Orthodox Christian world is now turning and becoming more friendly to Islam and showing more love and affection for Islam. I may not live to see, but my students will see it tomorrow. The love and the affection will, come, will become greater and greater despite the hatred and the enemy, enmity of my critics for them. Yes, it's going to happen. And so when you find a hadith which says of room, that room is going to betray you, <laughs> that, that someone is going to get up and say, the cross has been triumphant. And then a Muslim will get up and say, no, Allah has been triumphant. And he'll kill the Christian. <laughs> and because one Christian is killed, the whole Christian army will now turn against the Muslim army and wage war against Muslims. Would that qualify as room? An entire Christian army that wages war on the Muslim army because one person got up and killed a Christian? And so the, what the Quran says is false then. Eh? Can that be the room that the Quran is speaking about as room? You have to use the Quran to judge the Hadith. And whenever you find a hadith or a part of a hadith in conflict with the Quran, put it aside. It's going to be difficult, really difficult. It's going to require the best intellectual acumen you have. It remember the highest standard of scholarship and also nur from Allah, protection from error, to be able to wade through the hadith and locate the, the traps which are there, the fabrications which are there to misguide us and to corrupt us in our thinking. And so my conclusion is that we are now located at a moment in history when the Saudis are preparing, sharpening their swords, okay, for a big and a dramatic move of landing troops in Syria and taking the whole world of Sunni Islam with there, and the Qataris don't want a part of that at all. Because Qatar understands Saudi Arabia better than anybody else understands Saudi Arabia. Birds of a feather, you see. And because Qatar does not want to be a part of that, Qatar prefers to, pre to protect herself in this big war that's coming. That Qatar is saying, no, we're not prepared to go along. And the Qatar is maintaining friendly ties with, with, um, with Iran. I noticed that Russia has responded to Qatar's predicament, and Russia is sending uh, supplies of food, Iran is sending supplies of food, and uh, Turkey is standing with Qatar, because Turkey has a military base in Qatar. And so sending a message to Saudi Arabia that if you attempt any military intervention, you're going to have to face the Turkish army, which is the biggest army in NATO after, I think, Germany. Um, so what is going to happen now in Qatar is very interesting. The Saudis are not, not going to back down because this is their survival. For the Saudi regime to survive the great war that is coming, they need, they need, they need to establish themselves as the unchallenged and unchallengeable leaders of the world of Sunni Islam, and by the hook or by the crook, they have to f provoke Sunni Shia civil war. I want to ask of you, 
to think carefully of the views which I have expressed tonight. Do not accept my views unless and until you think about them carefully and unless and until you are convinced that I am correct. Remember that I make mistakes. Uh, in my next talk, uh, in the one that I'm going to be giving in Geneva later this month, I intend to take up the subject of Darbatul Ard. I believe I made a mistake on Darbatul Ard. Darbatul Ard is a beast of the earth. You know that the Prophet said, alayhi salatu wasalam, there were ten major signs of Akhir uh, Number one, uh, Dajjal. Number two, Gog and Magog. Number three, the return of the son of Mary, the true Messiah. Number four, Dukhan, or smoke. Number five, Darbatul Ard, the beast of the earth. Number six, that the sun will rise from the west, number seven, eight, and nine, three earthquakes, three sinking of the earth, and the earth swallows what it swallows, one in the east, one in the west, and one in Arabia, and number ten, that the fire will come out of Yemen and drive people to the place of assembly for judgment. These are the ten major signs mentioned in Sahih Muslim. Uh, one of them is the beast of the earth, and I came to the conclusion, based on the study of only the data located in the Qur'an and some of the Ahadith. I came to the conclusion that Darbatul Ard was the state of Israel. And a Saudi Sheikh, who is a very uh, acute thinker and writer, Sheikh Safar al-Hawali, uh, he came to the conclusion, much quite similar to mine, that is the Zionist movement. And his, his book was entitled Yawmul Ghadab. Uh, so our two views are very close to each other. He says the Zionist movement, I say the state of Israel. But I believe that I use wrong methodology. And the proper methodology on my part would have led me to another conclusion, which I will share with you, inshallah, when we have the seminar in Geneva on the 29th of July at 4 o'clock in the afternoon at the Sal Sabil uh, Halal Restaurant. If you're not as yet registered, uh, you don't have to register for the seminar, which starts at 4 o'clock in the afternoon. It's almost sub to Saturday, uh, the first Saturday of the month of Zulqa'ala, or the 29th of July. You don't have to register for the seminar, but you have to register if you want to join in the dinner, which takes place after the seminar in the main dining hall of the restaurant. Uh, go to my website and you'll see the email address for the restaurant where you can contact the restaurant to register for the for the dinner. So in that lecture on the 29th of July, inshallah, I hope to share with you my view on the subject of Darbatul Ard, one of the major signs of the last day, and to expand further on proper methodology for the subject of Akhir Zaman. I thank you for listening to me, and I hope and pray that Allah may guide us on the right path and protect us from error. From error. Thank you. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.